So you heard the success story of Palm, but, um, but I honestly feel like this Nobel Prize was ridiculously premature. Um, that the amount of biology that we've uncovered so far is a tiny, tiny sliver, for example, compared to what Ruska's electron microscope discovered after he got the Nobel Prize after waiting for 53 years. Um, and there's just a lot of problems in the field still, and it's still shaking itself out. So it's a bit premature. So one of the basic problems is that <clears throat> in the end, all we see are the fluorescent molecules. We don't see the proteins themselves. We see the molecules, the fluorescence. If the fluorescence happens to be where the molecules are, great. If not, we're in trouble. And also, not every protein molecule is labeled. And if you don't label enough, then you're just seeing little dots of light that are too widely separated to resolve the feature, underlying feature you want to see. That turns out to be a major problem in this field, that you know, even for a fairly modest level of resolution, you need to have many, many, many molecules in one spot. Way more than is normally done in a typical biology experiment in terms of the amount of fluorescent label. It can be done, but it's not done easily and many, many people in the field ignore it. Um, in order to get to those densities, sometimes you either coax the cell to produce too much protein so the cell actually gets sick from that or changes. The fluorescent protein itself can act like a bowling ball on the side of the protein you want so the protein doesn't act the same as it normally would. Um, you can use dyes that you introduce exogenously but then, unlike fluorescent proteins, they kind of go everywhere instead of just at the thing you want, and they don't go very densely. And the real killer oftentimes is much of what we know from super resolution is from cell, because it takes so long generally to get a super resolution image. You chemically fix the cell to freeze it in place. But those chemical fixatives are known to change the ultrastructure, so it kind of leaves you sort of scratching your head about how much you can trust the result even when everything else goes correctly. So, um, so why would you want to do fluorescence for high resolution microscopy given EM? Okay, There are two primary reasons. First, the EM kind of like in Harold's images he showed that osmium staining light you know, shows so many different things. It's kind of like seeing all the roads in Manhattan. But what if I only want to know where the Starbucks were in Manhattan? Then I need something like fluorescence to be able to light up one of the 10,000 different kinds of proteins at a time. So that's structural imaging with fluorescence protein-specific contrast. That's a great tool, but I just told you what the limitations of that were. Um, the other op fork in the road is, you know, there are even ways now to do genetic labeling for EM. And there are new, better ways people think of all the time about trying to do structural imaging with short wavelengths, radiation, x-rays, e beams, etc. Some of those may eventually even displace the methods of palm and so forth for super resolution imaging, for structural imaging. But all of those things basically involve vacuum and ionizing radiation, so they're not going to easily be doing live imaging. So the other real reason to do super resolution fluorescence is to do live imaging. But there's a problem here too, in that the three major methods have, have used a hell of a lot of light. So the other method that, that received the Nobel Prize was something called STED by Stefan Hell. I won't tell you what that is, but I'll tell you that life evolved outside under a tenth of a watt per square centimeter. STED requires intensities anywhere from 10,000 watts per square centimeter to usually a gigawatt per square centimeter. So although there have been demonstrations of live cell, there have been very few controls to say, what this is doing to your cell, okay? Um, palm is a little bit gentler, but you're still talking kilowatts per square centimeter on live cells. Um, there's a third technique, which did not win the Nobel Prize, called structured illumination microscopy. So in this method, you illuminate the sample, not uniformly, but with a standing wave of light, and that can demodulate information that's beyond the resolution limit into the passband of the microscope where it can be detected. It only gets you a factor of two beyond the diffraction limit normally. And so that's really the reason why it didn't share the prize, although I think that's misplaced. But because it's not asking for as much, it offers more in other aspects. So it, it requires far less light than the other methods, 
requires far less burning out all of the fluorescences in there in order to get an image. And so it's probably the method that's most compatible with live imaging. So you can see this is showing under one of the gentler super resolution methods from Stefan Hell's group, applying the exact same parameters in his paper to a cell that we were looking at and how long that cell lasts. So um, I think there's still a lot we have to learn about treating cells gently for live imaging. So, um, and this is really common sense. If you want to have higher spatial resolution, your image has to have more pixels. If it has more pixels, it means you're taking more measurements, and that's going to take more time. And it means that you're throwing more potentially damaging light at the specimen. So if you're going to be honest, you're always playing off somewhere inside of this tetrahedron, balancing one thing against another. You can't have everything at the exact same time. Okay. The guy who understood this better than any of us was Mats Gustafsson, who um, worked first as a postdoc and then a PI at UCSF. And then we were able to recruit him to come to Janelia in 2008. He developed this method of structured illumination microscopy I just discussed. And even though it only offers that factor of two, you can see what it means in terms of live imaging. So here you're looking at the endoplasmic reticulum at 100 nanometer resolution, not 20, but now you're looking at very high speed, three quarters of a second acquisition, for 1,800 time points without bleaching that cell and without it retracting. So really, you're getting a wealth of information, some of it spatially, but much of it dynamic, that you wouldn't have been able to get otherwise. This is another example looking at a T cell, such as Fites infection, that's <coughs> plopped against the cover slip that has antigens that provokes what's known as the immunological synapse, and looking at then at the flow of actin inside of that synapse, taking data in 100 milliseconds per frame, which is at least two orders of magnitude faster than any other method. So if the knock against, the, the, the bad news is that while we were able to recruit Mott's, coming to work one day in 2009, he fell off his bike, went to the doctor and was diagnosed with a glioblastoma. And he died of that in 2011. And so after he passed away, I sort of inherited his group, particularly Lin Xiao, who was in his group, both at UCSF and then at Genelia. And so I wanted to see what I could do to, to continue this, this technology that I believe so strongly in. I really love localization microscopy, but I love SIM too. And if Mots was the messiah of SIM, I am his acolyte, and I am trying to spread the gospel of SIM as much as I can. So um, if the knock against SIM is that it is limited to 100 nanometer resolution, what can we do about it? The simple and stupid thing is just increase the numerical aperture of our lens to get higher resolution. Olympus sells an objective at 1.7 NA to go in total internal reflection. So you only see the bottom of the cell, but there you can see it very well. And we use that to study clathrin mediated endocytosis. So cells bring in small molecular cargoes through their membrane by creating these sort of cage baskets of clathrin, which then internalize and pinch off and then, and then go inside. And the FNS and field and turf only illuminates this part of it, so they appear as rings in this image. But now we're seeing that at 80 nanometer resolution. And again, with SIM, we can see it live. So now you're watching really the dynamics of clathrin-mediated endocytosis how these pits initially form from individual sort of uh, nucleation centers of clathrin, form these mature pits, pinch off, and then go in internalize. So it's been um, sort of a controversy in, in the clathrin field for a while about, again, that actin cytoskeleton and the role it plays in clathrin-mediated endocytosis. And so one of the other major advantages of SIM is unlike Stead and Palm, which require these fancy switching principles of fluorescent molecules and hence are very limited in the set of probes they can use. SIM can use any fluorescent marker, so it's easy to do multicolor imaging. So here we're looking at a combination of the clathrin coated pits. Some of them are isolated pits, some are larger plaques, and the relationship to the cortical actin right near the plasma membrane. So in doing that, um, what we learned is that actin can have a role, but it's only recruited about half the time. But when it is recruited, it has a small but statistically significant role in shortening the lifetime. 
we also saw, and it's seen a long time at the diffraction limit, these big fuzzy, fuzzier blobs of clathrin, which are known as plaques. And in these cells, we were able to show that these plaques are nothing more than aggregations of pits, which occasionally spin off, addition, uh, spin off from the plaque. We also found these weird little rings of actin, similar to the rings of clathrin. Now, one of the models of clathrin-mediated endocytosis says that a ring of actin actually pinches off the neck of this growing sort of a light bulb of that clathrin-coated pit to, to create, break it free from the membrane. But we found that these rings were not correlated positionally to the clathrin. So although they're very common, they're really not reported much in the EM literature, and we don't know what the hell their function is. So that gets, got us to 80, but what if we want to get even closer to palm instead resolution? Well, Moss had been working on using the same photoswitching principles in something called nonlinear structured illumination to increase the number of harmonics in the excitation, the same way like in the movie Spinal Tap where they turn it up to 11, right? And then there's all this distortion that goes, and you get these other frequencies that are involved. But you can use that to get higher resolution. We do this here in a new way that I won't get into to get to now 62 nanometer resolution, you can see as we scroll between the different methods to get down to that level, but then we can do live imaging at that point, and then you can at 60 nanometer resolution look at living cells. This is really by far the state of the art for super resolution live imaging, non-invasively. So the moral of the story of SIM was while well, the rest of the world was trying to go to this higher resolution as you possibly can. Um, Motz understood that that wasn't necessarily the thing to do, following in the same mode that, that we did when we developed palms, to try to go where other, or when I did near field, is try to go where other people aren't. And for me in 2008, um, I, you know, I talked in the first part about how sick I was of palm, or how sick I was of near field in 1994, in part because of the limitations of the technology and in part because how it became this huge fad and the signal noise of the field went down. Well, the exact damn, same damn thing happened with Palm and Super Resolution in 2008. And so again, the signal was the same and the noise goes way up and I get very frustrated because I understood all the limitations of the technology as I started in this part of the talk telling you about. And everybody else is saying the moon is made of green cheese and everybody believes it. And so I really felt like I was living the same bad nightmare over for a second time. And I was sick of Palm, and I wanted to do something new. And Moss's idea of pushing back, and again going in an area where other people aren't, uh, appealed to me. And so in 2008, I was looking for a new challenge. I mean, if we learn a lot by backing off from spatial resolution and gaining temporal resolution at 100 nanometers, what if we take that to an extreme and say, screw super resolution, let's go back to the diffraction limit. Is there something we can do that would make a microscope as transformative in the time domain as Palm was in the space domain to be able to look at cells in 3D non-invasively at high speed? And so that's what I made my challenge then. So why would you want to do that? I mean, the thing is, is that the thing that defines life is that it's animate. And every living thing is a complex thermodynamic pocket of reduced entropy through which matter and energy is flowing continuously. So while structural information like EM and POM will always be important, a really complete understanding of how we go from those inanimate molecules to the animate life is going to require high resolution inf imaging across all four dimensions of space-time at the same time. So the good news is that the usual tools that are used for live cell imaging leave a lot of room for improvement. These are the wide field microscope that you know from a high school class, and if you're in the biology field, the confocal microscope where you focus light into the sample. The bad thing about these tools for 3D imaging is that you usually bring the light through the, the objective and collect it the same way, the fluorescence, but you're blasting away at the entire thickness of the specimen even though only a single plane at a time is in focus. And so you're doing a lot of damage. So in my opinion, one of the most important innovations in microscopy in the last 15 years, and may prove more important than super resolution, is when Ernst Stelzer at the EMBL in 2004 
reintroduced a 100-year-old idea called flame illumination. In this microscope, you add a second lens from the side, say, for example, a cylindrical lens, which creates a sheet of light, which is coincident with this detection focal plane of this perpendicular detection objective. And so you illuminate a whole plane at once. You don't have to scan a point, so it's blazingly fast. And you don't illuminate the areas above and below at all, so you're not doing any bleaching or damages to that part of the specimen. You can then drive that plane by plane through the thing and generate an image very quickly. Um, the, sim the simple ideas are often the best, and this is a beautifully elegant simple idea. It has proved to be transformative for being able to study embryogenesis at single cell re resolution. But it has one primary disadvantage, and that's that diffraction causes a trade-off between how flat this light sheet can be and how thick it can be. And over the dimensions of a single cell, it's pretty damn thick. It's about three to five microns thick. But a cultured cell might be on the order of six to ten microns thick. So you're really not gaining much benefit of plane illumination at that level. But once, I, once you understood that limitation, it became obvious to me in 2008 that there was an immediate solution, and that was to use not a regular Gaussian beam to create the light sheet, but instead something called a Bessel beam, which is a, this idea that's been invented many times. I, I first heard of it in 1989 when a guy at University of Rochester called a non-diffracting beam. So it's a way by illuminating your lens, not with continuously in the pupil, but with just a little ring, which then decouples the length of the pencil of light that comes out, the length of it from its diameter. It's the same technology that's used in supermarket checkout scanners to create a thin beam of light to go over the barcode. Um, and so the idea was, OK, well, if we can decouple those things, we can make a thinner light sheet. We would scan the Bessel beam in and out of the screen, snap an image, go to the next plane, do the same thing, blah, 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 as we go our way through the cell. That sounds slow, but in our modern implementations, we go up to 1,000 planes a second or several volumes per second through cells. So that worked. We started applying that. First, this is a C. elegans, or a nematode embryo in the initial stages of its development. It's going this through the initial gastrulation, which is going to form the gut. And these green things represent forces that are pulling in these cells. We're able to show that those forces actually precede them coming in, so there's a clutch mechanism that has to engage. This is looking at stem cells which when they divide, one mode in which they can divide is that one partner can become a differentiated cell and the other one still a stem cell, and that's called asymmetric stem cell division. They're incredibly light sensitive when you do that in a normal microscope. But with the Bessel microscope, we were able to study, there's a signaling protein on this blue bead. And we were able to show that that serves to orient the direction in which it's going to divide and makes it so the one that's closest to that source of signaling protein stays a stem cell while the other one becomes a differentiated cell. So one of the things that we found is in order to speed up this process instead of scanning the vessel beam, we introduced an array of seven parallel vessel beams. And that turned out to be faster, but it was also amazing and shockingly so much less phototoxic to have seven beams rather than one. So it's, I started to say, well, why stop at seven? So I started to model what would happen if vessel beams got close enough together that there's these, normally they look like in, in cross-section, actually like a bullseye, and these side lobes can interfere. So that's modeling what happens when that happens there. The side lobes are a problem because they cause out-of-focus excitation. But you know, the moral of the story was is that, is that um, having more beams was a lot less toxic. And what that says in the final analysis is that while the total dose of light you throw at a cell is important, by far or much more important for the health of the cell is the instantaneous power that you deliver to the cell. So that means that a plane is better than a line and a line is better than a point. But confocal microscopes largely use a point or else an array of points, which is better than one point but still not very good. So in my opinion, Confocal microscopes, which is pretty much the gold standard for live cell imaging, may represent the stupidest possible way to do live cell imaging, 
because not only do you have these cones of light above and below that are bleaching the regions above and below, at the focus itself you have this actinic spot of light that's going and it's leaving death and destruction in its way. So you really have to spread the light out. By modeling this and finding how we could spread it out, what we found is that there were certain periods of these Bessel beams where you would get destructive interference of these side lobes, which is what you want to get rid of all that out of focus haze, have a hundred percent modulation in the plane, which means then we can apply Matz's techniques of structured illumination to do super resolution really well. And you spread the energy out to make it non-phototoxic. So that's a triple win. Those don't come often very often very much in life. It's like you know, finding a spouse who is rich and beautiful and has a heart of gold, okay? It's, it doesn't happen a lot. So, um, so uh, um, this, this is, the other crazy thing about this is these very special periods where this happens, this is where I was kicking myself because in the first talk I mentioned this optical lattice microscope that I was pitching before Palm. It turns out that these periods where this magic happens were the periods that were predicted by my optical lattice theory that I developed before I abandoned it to do palm. So once I made that connection, I could dust off that old optical lattice theory and apply it to decide how to create these kinds of special light sheets. This is what we call the lattice light sheet microscope. So you can run this microscope in one of two modes. Like I say, you can use that structured pattern, take five images per plane, and get super resolution. Here you're looking at Philopodi on a HeLa cell and you can see the higher resolution. Or you can dither it a little bit back and forth to average it out so it mimics a continuous plane. Take one image per plane, less resolution but much faster. So seven and a half times faster. So there's a high res mode and a high speed mode. It pains me to say it as a guy who has spent most of his career developing super resolution instruments. But of the 35 plus different groups we have collaborated with since on this microscope, 90% of the time they would rather have the speed than the resolution. So um, that's what we normally do. <coughs> so there's many advantages to this microscope. The first is one of the many skeletons in the closet of super resolution techniques, whether it's SIMS, STED, or POM, is that they're usually limited to fairly thin samples because otherwise, Again, there's only one plane in focus, and the other planes that are also glowing create so much background or signal noise is too low to do any good experiment with. So the beauty of the lattice light sheet is that it's so thin, it's thinner than the depth of focus of even a high NA objective that's being used to detect the light. So essentially, only molecules that are in focus are illuminated, and so you have turf-like signal to noise to do single molecule imaging in arbitrarily thick samples. In this case, looking at a 35 micron diameter spheroid of mouse embryonic stem cells, where, we're, where our collaborators were able to study the binding kinetics of transcription factors to DNA. Um, and in a more, it's gone now, but this is the normal wide field image, like normal single molecule techniques. This is what you get with the lattice light sheet. Here we were working with James Liu at Genelia to be able to show that there are certain hot spots inside of the nucleus where these particular transcription factors want to bind to particular sites in the DNA. <clears throat> so that actually turned out to be useful for localization microscopy again, because again, usually in these techniques you're limited to thin samples. And remember the other problem of any super resolution technique is getting enough label in there in order to be able to get the resolution by decorating enough. So um, in the same year that Harold and I published the Palm paper, there was a professor of chemistry at Penn, Robin Hochstrasser, who published a similar idea where you have your whole media around your cell with fluorescent molecules in it. And these are normally whizzing by by Brownian motion so fast they just look like a blur. But if they attach to the cell in the area you want, then they're fixed long enough that they look like a glowing dot and you localize it that way. So that's called paint. So the problem with paint is your whole damn media is glowing, so the signal noise is really bad generally. But again, lattice light sheet's perfect for that. So not only can you do good paint, you can do it on much, much thicker samples than anybody's done localization before. So here we're doing two color paint imaging of looking at all the intracellular membranes and then the plasma membrane 
in a dividing cell during cytokinesis. And here we're looking at something as big as a whole zebrafish embryo. So something on the order of a millimeter, although we're only looking over a small region, at the sensor organ on the surface called the neuromass. And in a normal 3D palm experiment, you might have on the order of a few million molecules. Here you're talking 300 million, and here you're talking over a billion molecules. Because unlike palm where you only label it once and that's it, with paint you have an infinite army of molecules in the media that can just keep coming and keep coming and keep coming. So if you're patient enough, you're going to get a lot of localizations, which means you have a lot of information. And now it doesn't look like a field of dots, it starts to look like a multicolor EM image in 3D. So, but frankly, I'm sick and tired of looking at dead things. And the beauty of the lattice light sheet is it's non-invasiveness to look at live things. So here's a case of doing three color imaging, looking at chromosomes, mitochondria, and the endoplasmic reticulum in a field of cells that's undergoing cell division. So we take that field and we cut it up in like two micron thick slabs so you can see what's happening in each slab. And then here's an example where you can see the endoplasmic reticulum, which is normally this big net, folds up into these little pockets. The mitos, which are normally long sausages, break up and they neatly fit inside of those pockets and are carried along as the cell divides. So normally cells, when they're dividing, are also very light sensitive because they don't want to replicate division errors. And so they have these mitotic checkpoints where the whole thing will shut down if they're unhappy. But here we took 300 time points in each of three different colors. So that's 900 3D volumes. It represents half a million 2D images for this data set. And these cells divided perfectly happily. If you've used a confocal microscope, you know that even 200 images in a single 2D plane can get you into trouble often enough. So it's way less toxic. There are many samples, if the rate of turnover of fluorescent protein is fast enough, you can image them forever because they, the, new, the ones that you're losing to bleaching are replaced by new ones being produced by the cell. So next level up is then looking at cell-cell interactions. I mentioned the T-cell in the SIM experiment before. This is now looking at a T-cell in 3D interacting with an antigen presenting cell to try to find out what the infection is and then forming this immunological synapse. And we discovered this very fast flow of actin along the side. Another hot topic in cell biology is cell motility because that's important in cancer metastasis as they start to colonize new areas in the body. Much of those studies are done on a 2D cover slip, which is a pretty poor model. So this is looking at a cell in collagen in 3D and studying its migration in that type of environment. So next level up then is going to whole embryos. So this is that nematode embryo, C. elegans, in an early stage looking at division phases, and there's this little thing bump there, which is AR2, which is a protein which is believed to be just a, a piece of garbage left over after cell division, but our collaborator believes it actually has an important role in subsequent development, and we're studying that. Um, in the latest stages of C. elegant development, once the muscles get going, it's too fast to follow in 3D, even with our scope, but if you park at one 2D plane, you can do fine 2D imaging of the dynamics of what's going in and out of that plane. So the last problem, though, with lattice light sheet, or with any microscope, is that life has to be heterogeneous, heterogeneous in order to work. The nuclei have a different refractive index than mitochondria, than cytoplasm, than lipids, etc. And so all these different refractive indices act like little lenses and stuff that take the light rays as they go in to create a focus and scramble them. And so it's the same effect as when you have water on your windshield and you haven't put on the wipers and you get that messy view, okay? So our light sheet gets scrambled going in, our light that's illuminated by the light sheet gets scrambled on the way out. So how are we gonna deal with that if our goal is ultimately to be able to look deep into organisms with all of these tools instead of cells immortalized on a cover slip? Well, astronomers had to deal with that problem 50 years ago because the atmosphere does the same scrambling to light from distant astron astronomical objects. And the solution they came up with is something called adaptive optics. So you take the light from the star, you bounce it off a mirror that can change its shape, you pick off a fraction of the light, 
put it in a sensor that dis measures the distortion to the wavefront, puts it in a closed loop through a computer, and then changes the shape of that deformal mirror to exactly, ban exactly cancel out those wavefront aberrations, get a flat wavefront and a perfect focus. So this is a star without AO and with AO, and because you're concentrating the light back to a point, your signal goes from this to this, and your image goes from this to this. So without adaptive optics, the biggest ground-based telescope on Earth won't have better angular resolution than an 8-inch reflector you can have in your backyard. But with adaptive optics, the best ground-based telescopes exceed the resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope, in the infrared anyway. And the next generation of scopes, like the 30-meter scope they're going to build, will be absolutely mind-blowing. I mean, just make everything we have obsolete. So um, we wanted to, a number of groups, ourselves included, have been trying to apply this to microscopy. The simplest way to do it, if you have a transparent organism, like this zebrafish, which is a small little worm, in the embryonic stage, it's about the width of a fingernail clipping. Um, is what they do in astronomy, because the galaxy is too dim, is they shine a laser up into the stratosphere to excite sodium atoms to create a fluorescent guide star. And then that provides the photons that go into that sensor. So we use something called two-photon microscopy to excite some fluorescence locally inside of the fish. Use that to create a fluorescent guide star there, which then comes out and goes to the sensor. And with the adaptive optics, deep in the spinal cord region of a live fish, three days after fertilization, the signal and resolution go from this, and after you recover the fraction limited resolution signal, you go to that. And so um, the problem in microscopy is that when you look in one area, you're going through some material in the fish. You go to the next region, the light rays are going through different materials. So you have to keep updating your adaptive optic correction. This method is really good at doing that fast and non-invasive. So this volume, large volume here, represents 20,000 different adaptive optic corrections. And now we're moving into the fish about 200 microns deep in the midbrain region, and we're about to turn off the adaptive optics in one second. That's what you would see with a normal microscope going inside of the zebrafish, and that's what you get. Again, we're not doing any super resolution here. We're just getting back to the diffraction. Many biologists who do de developmental biology with standard imaging tools has no idea how far from the diffraction limit they are. So this is part of that educational process. But the ultimate goal from this is now doing, looking at dynamics by two photon microscopy, but it's dirt slow compared to the last slide sheet, and it's damaging. So the goal of my group in the future, again, is, is to take cell biology away from the cover slip and to be able to study cells non-invasively with high speed using lattice light sheet, to be able to do a deep inside of where they evolve, where there's all the cell-cell signaling and everything else with the adaptive optics, and then be able to scroll in techniques like SIM and PALM if we need to push the resolution from there. So with that, I'd like to conclude. Um, there have been so many people in my career, but even my my latest life at Janelia since 2006 to thank. Harold, of course, is at the top of the list. I thanked him before. Um, one of the nice things about Janelia is, in many ways, it is the reincarnation of Bell. And I really feel like the reason I've been successful in my career is because I have been always able to find somebody willing to support me to just work in the lab by myself. If I were in a standard academic career, probably 20 years ago I would have been put into an office somewhere and all the students would get to have all the fun and I'd be writing the grants and doing all the rest. And even, even a little bit of that, to me, is death. I mean, I, have tr I can't multitask. I mean, I really have to focus. And it isn't so much even the integral of the time it takes to sit on a committee or write a grant or teach a course or whatever. It's, it's, the, it's the breaking of the mental momentum that, that you know, you, you really, really need the opportunity to think long and hard and alone about a problem in order to make progress on it. When I was writing, working out my Nobel address, I looked at what other Nobelians said. If there is one common theme, it's this ability to be left alone and isolated to be able to concentrate with your full attention on a problem for long periods of time. 
was one of the key things leading to their success. And I couldn't agree more. And so it really, you know, if there's one way I want to use the Nobel soapbox, it's that, yes, science is underfunded, and Greg will tell you about that. But, um, but I think that it's also a little bit misplaced, okay, is that why don't we have, I mean, everybody admits that Bell was a fantastic, productive environment. The MRC LMB in Cambridge, which is the other model on which Bell was based, was the, the place to be during the whole Watson Crick, the whole molecular biology phase in the 50s and 60s. And it had a very similar model to Bell, no tenure, no teaching, you know, small labs, etc. Um, Janili, I believe, is really getting its wings right now and is going to be a premier place to do research following that same model. Why, if it's so damn successful, why don't we do it more often? Why is 99% of the money spent in the more traditional ways? You know, again, whether it's philanthropy, and I'd be happy if it was philanthropy, or government, I think we need to create more Bell Labs and have the opportunities, particularly for young people. I was, what, 20, 28 when I had my own lab. I didn't have to do a postdoc. I went straight from graduate school and given my own lab to do stuff at Bell. That opportunity should exist for other people now who just have the, you know, the courage to try to do something. And so hopefully I will eventually talk to the right audience who has the bucks to make that kind of thing happen. Thank you very much.